Hey everyone, this is James Wilson with MTB Strength Training Systems and BikeJames.com and today we are going to talk about one of those sacred cows in cycling in general, you know, in the mountain biking world for us and that is seated pedaling and just starting to look at all the, the myths behind seated pedaling that keep riders locked to their saddle and why standing pedaling is actually a much better option for us as mountain bikers. So I am fighting a little bit of a cold today, so I apologize if I, feel, if I sound a little off, or, but uh, we are going to power through this. Now this is a bit of a rabbit hole because there are a lot of layers to this subject. It's not as simple as this is good and this is bad. It's understanding, well, how did seated pedaling get the status that it has today? Why is it the preferred method for most riders? And we're told that you need to you know, sit down as much as possible and only stand up when you need to. And, uh, you know, for a lot of riders, uh, hearing me say that you need to stand up more, it comes as a bit of a surprise because again, most, uh, things that you read, most, you know, coaches and stuff are going to say that seated pedaling is going to be more efficient or whatever. Right. And we'll dig into some of these things as to why that's not necessarily true. But, you know, like I said, we need to figure out, well, why did seated pedaling get to this, uh, to this place, right? Where did this sit and spin, um, particularly at a high RPM, uh, where did this advice come from? And then we can look at it and see, well, is that actually true? And, you know, is it flawed? And are there some, some better approaches that we can take? So first off, I need to get this out of the way. I am not saying you need to be standing up on the trail all of the time, right? People like to take what I say to an extreme and that's not what I'm saying. So I have a concept that I call the four quadrants of pedaling. And you can do a search on my site at bikejames.com. I got a video that breaks that down and I'll, I'll uh, link to it in the show notes here. But it outlines the basically how I think you should use standing and seated pedaling uh, in combination with high and low tension efforts. Now this is kind of an important concept for you to understand uh, is what is the difference between a high tension and a low tension effort, right? So a low tension effort is an easy effort that doesn't require a lot of tension in the core and the body to, to keep things going. High tension efforts are higher tension, right? You gotta, you gotta lock down the core, create more tension in the body. So think about like just cruising down the street or an easy piece of single track, right? Like that's an, a low tension effort. Uh, a high tension effort is like a technical climb or you're trying to sprint and go faster. <clears throat> Excuse me, these things are high tension efforts, right? Like navigating a rock garden or hitting a drop. Like there are higher tension levels required by the body to do these things. So in a nutshell, I think that you should sit down for low tension, easier efforts and you should stand up for high tension, harder efforts. And if you do that, you're gonna make best use of both uh, types of pedaling, right? So the you're gonna get more performance out of your riding, and you're also gonna avoid a lot of overuse injuries. And so again, I'll dig into why this is. Like seated pedaling is terrible for your body. I don't care what bike fit you have. I don't care what you know bike you have. I don't care any of that stuff. S sitting down and pedaling is, from a functional movement standpoint, is a turd. And you can polish that turd up all you want, but it's still a turd, okay? It is a bad position for you to try to create strength and power from. It's very difficult for you to move efficiently from. And, and so uh, you need to learn how to use it in the right context, but then also use standing pedaling to help improve your performance and avoid a lot of these overuse injuries. So first, why, like I said, what, what are the arguments for seated pedaling? And then do these things withstand some scrutiny and some questioning. Okay, so first we're told that seated high RPM pedaling is quote unquote more efficient. Now, efficiency is this word that gets thrown around a lot in the mountain biking world and few people really are using it correctly, right? When they say like clipless pedals will make you more efficient on a climb, right? Like efficiency is a measure of how much power you're getting versus how much power you're putting in, okay? And so a higher efficiency means you're getting more power out for the power being put in. Now what happens, especially with seated pedaling, is that people confuse easier with more efficient. Okay, so something could be easier, and so your power input is low, and so it feels easy, but that doesn't mean that it's more efficient, right? You may actually find that a higher power output, the, the way that you're creating that power actually makes it as efficient or you know more potentially more efficient. 
And so don't confuse what feels easier, especially until you've adapted to it with efficient, right? Because this is one of those things that people say and, and then people just accept it because their, their experience tells them like, oh yeah, standing pedaling is harder. I must be just burning energy like crazy when I do that. That's gotta be a super inefficient way to pedal. And so I need to sit down and, and spend this high RPM and, and as much as possible. Okay, so this isn't, uh, you know, one, like I said, this is based on riders' experiences who aren't good with standing pedaling, right? So that you got to take that into account. And there are studies and anecdotal evidence. I got a, a video, I think it's a Global Mountain Bike News that did a video where they were comparing seated and standing climbing. And they found that the, the, they were the same, like metabolically, overall metabolically, that they were the same efficiency. You weren't, you know, blowing through power like crazy when you stood up versus sitting down. And again, there's been some some other studies that have confirmed this, but the, the point is, is that standing pedaling from a scientific standpoint is not less efficient, right? If you understand what efficiency means, then you look at the metabolic efficiency of how your body is creating power, the seated versus standing, and you see that they're very similar, all right? So first off, it's not less efficient. So we need to need to just throw that out the window right there. But you are creating that movement more efficiently. From a functional movement standpoint, standing up is a much, much, much better uh, way to look at this, right? And so again, like, the way that I look at riding a bike, and again, my background, I don't, I didn't come from cycling, right? Like I ran track, I, you know, been into lifting weights for a long time. And so I got into mountain biking a little bit through the back door. And so I didn't come up as a cyclist. I didn't spend all my formative years, right? I got into it in my early twenties. And so I had this kind of outsider view of cycling. And so what the approach that I take is well, what does, what's the best way that the human body moves, right? Like what is the, the most functional, efficient way for the human body to move? And then how do we apply that to the bike? And you'd be surprised, you would assume that that's how a lot of advice is arrived at for how to ride your bike and pilot your bike. But that's not the case, right? There are a lot of violations of functional movement going on with a lot of common advice around riding and bike setup and things like that. And it just comes from people not understanding what is good functional movement and then critically applying that to cycling as opposed to just, you know, regurgitating the same thing that we've always said forever without critically thinking about it, right? And so that's what, how I come to these thoughts and, and, and these conclusions. And so again, from a functional movement standpoint, when you stand up, you're gonna get more hip extension, right? The hips are the strongest muscles in the body and they are designed to take the, the most brunt of the work, right? And so the more you can get your hips into whatever movement you're, you're creating, the better, right? You get your weight, your center of gravity shifts forward. So now your weight is actually over your, your bottom bracket and pedals. And so you can actually use gravity to help you turn the pedals over, right? That's just, that's free, uh, you know, uh, pressure and force right there right? You're able to get your core engaged better, right? When you're sitting down, bending over, your core is not engaged properly. And so when you stand up, you can achieve a better spine position and you're going to be able to have your core engaged better. And then finally, you're going to achieve full knee extension. And this is super important. Again, something a lot of riders don't realize is that when you, uh, you want your knee to be stable at full extension or right, at, the, at the bottom of your, your, your movement pattern, right? Whether you're walking, running, pedal stroke, whatever that is. To have that, you need the knee to be fully extended with pressure at the foot because that activates a co-contraction between the quad and the hamstring, which stabilizes the knee and stabilizes it as you're running force through that last little bit of range of motion. And so you're not able to do that when you're sitting down. Even the best bike fit in the world, you're not going to be able to get 100% full knee extension and you're not going to have pressure at the pedals because the pressure is going to be more on the seat. And so that keeps you from getting that co-contraction, which actually protects your knee. So again, a reason a lot of riders have back problems and knee problems and stuff like that is because they rely way too much on seated pedaling, which has them in this disadvantaged movement position and then you're you know trying to create power and movement from that and it's going to cause problems okay you cannot get around that the, the laws of functional movement and how we we best function don't go flying out the window just because we threw our legs over a bike i know the cycling industry tries really hard to convince us of that right it's quote unquote different 
but it's not, right? It's just, it's like the old saying, right? Like methods are many, principles are few, right? The methods may change, uh, but the, the, you know, principles never do, right? So you just, what are the principles? And then you, the methods may be a little bit different, but it, uh, you're, the principles are the same, right? And so, <clears throat> excuse me, so standing up is a much better position for the body to create movement and power from. And so this is also a reason why I'm not a big fan of bike fits for mountain bikers. Again, it's another really controversial statement that I make, but I think bike fits, especially for mountain bikers, are completely overrated. In a lot of cases, unnecessary and a waste of money, right? So you need a bike that fits, right? There's a difference between a bike that fits you properly and is set up properly and then a bike fit, right? A bike fit is where you've got somebody using some sort of formula and all these measurements and trying to get your body in just this right position, uh, you know, based on, like I said, this, this, the pre-existing formula that they have for what's supposed to be the best position for your body. And the problem is, is that all of this revolves around seated pedaling, right? And so they're measuring you when you're sitting down. As soon as you stand up, all those measurements just go flying out the window. They don't mean anything, right? As soon as you stand up, you've just ruined the bike fit. And so if you're, and also if you're not over relying on seated pedaling, you don't need that seated pedaling position to be quote unquote perfect, right? And so it's only if you are using high tension efforts in the seated pedaling position that you're gonna find a benefit to a bike fit. Cause again, you're trying to polish that turd as best you can, right? And so a bike fit can help you polish that turd. It's still a turd, right? Stand up, get away from that turd of a, of a pedaling position and you don't have to worry about polishing it up, right? Cause you're, you're not overusing it. And that, again, that's the problem. People overuse seated pedaling. And so it makes the bike fits you know, uh, more valuable for them. But if you just stood up more and use standing and seated pedaling properly, you don't need a bike fit, all right? Like, don't, don't worry about that stuff. So it is the high tension efforts that create stiffness and overuse injuries, right? And, and so you want to make sure that when you're creating these high tension efforts, you want to do that on the best movement patterns and the best platform possible, right? So when you're sitting down and you're trying to grind up this hard climb and you're running a ton of tension through your body and you're in this like adult fetal position on the bike, you're running all that tension. You're locking yourself in that position. Your body creates stiffness as a result of continued high tension in a specific position. So if you want to av avoid a lot of the stuff that goes along with that, stand up, right? Run the high tension through a better spine position, better shoulder position, better knee uh, you know, stabilization, all these things that you get when you stand up. And if you run that high tension through that, platform, you're not going to run into the same problems that you're going to run into if you are running high tension through the seated pedaling platform. So uh, another argument that people will make is that um, seated pedaling has a, uh, is seated pedaling with a high RPM is the most metabolically efficient way to pedal. Okay. So they're going to, you know, again, the, the, the theory, right? Like what's the theory behind this? People hear this, but what's the theory? Well, the theory is is that somewhere around 80 to 90 RPM, your body shifts from it being a meta, like a, a muscular stress, right? The tension levels lower to the point to where it becomes more of an, an aerobic system stress than a muscular system stress. Like you get to that 80 RPM mark and below, and it's more that the tension levels are high enough to where it's more of a muscular system stress. And so your aerobic system theoretically has way more fuel and can go way longer than the, uh, th than your muscles can. And so if you can, can rely more on that aerobic system than on, on the muscles. And again, this is a very rough generalization, right? Like the aerobic system fuels the muscles, but again, it's, it's a tension thing, right? Like you're at a, at a certain point, the tension levels are low enough to where it's just a matter of, can the aerobic system keep up the fueling for the muscles? The muscles aren't going to fatigue because they're just not being placed under enough stress, but it is a matter of, can you continue to get fuel to them? Right. And so it becomes an aerobic system problem as opposed to a muscular system problem where you're trying to create muscles that are more fatigue resistant. Right. And so, uh, you know, at these higher tensions. So where did this come from? Right. And so, again, a lot of people don't realize that this advice became very popular around the time of Lance Armstrong and the, the Carmichael training system, the Chris Carmichael, the guy that trained Lance Armstrong, he came up with this theory. Right. This was a, a theory that he pushed. 
and and it's a big part of the Carmichael training system. Now, here's one of the problems, right? Lance Armstrong, as great as he was, and you know we can argue whether he was cheating because everybody else was doing drugs too or whatever, but the fact of the matter is that dude was on a lot of juice, right? He was on a lot of EPO. He he had his hematocrit levels like way higher than normal, and so what this means is that his system could handle a higher aerobic load than you or I can, right? And so you kind of got to call that into question. Well, if we're basing this theory on the performance of someone who is using a lot of drugs and you're not using a lot of drugs, then is there exactly a one-to-one ratio of what you can take from what that guy was doing and what you can do? I'm going to argue no, that you need to, that, that there's more to it, right? So, um, you know, if you look at road cycling, even at the highest levels of road cycling, you're going to find riders who are successful with a sit and spin style, and you're going to find riders who are successful with a more aggressive use of standing pedaling, right? There is no one way to do this, despite what people will try and convince you. Again, if you look at the world of sport and eat, like I said, even road cycling at the highest levels, you're going to find people who are successful with both styles of riding. And so there isn't a one way that fits everyone. In fact, you could argue that people who are, are, you know, Lance Armstrong was a smaller rider. And so he didn't have the levers to create the same kind of power that some of the bigger riders who had better levers could create. And so he had to rely more on that sit and spin mentality than a bigger rider who's got those bigger levers and can create that power more efficiently, right? So there's there's arguments even there as to like, well, it's, it, there's just so much, right? There's not one way that's going to work for everyone all of the time, okay? So right there, we need to just, there, there might be more to this story. So, but even if we are going to say, right, that seated high RPM pedaling can be more efficient. And, and I believe that it can. There are cases. I don't, I don't think that I'm saying, like, don't ever use seated high RPM pedaling. What I'm saying is that there's, there's more to the story, right? And so you can't get away from the fact that the trail is going to require you to navigate problems that require the use of your skills, right? And these, your, your technical skills are always best used from a standing position. Right, and so these these areas of riding, these are usually also the highest risk areas of riding, and so you know technical sections, technical climbs, you know jumps, drops, things like that. And if you're not strong with standing pedaling, you feel that standing pedaling is is a weakness of yours, and you're not strong and stable and confident there. And you're one of these people. I see this all the time. People know they need to stand up to execute their skills. They will stay sitting down spinning as long as they can before they have to stand up at the last moment and then try and execute their skills through the problem. That does not work. You are much better off if you actually shift into your standing pedaling with more tension at the pedals before you get to the problem. And you have a chance to kind of align yourself using that pedaling style because it is a different pedaling style. When you stand up, you do need to shift up to a higher gear and get more tension at the pedals. And so if you're trying to do all of this very quickly, stand up, shift, and start executing your skills, it's gonna be very tough, very tough to do properly. And so again, I see this all the time on the trail, people spinning their way up to a technical climb and then trying to stand up and, and, and navigate it at, at the last second. And it just, it, it almost never works, right? Or they'll try and use the sit and, uh, you know, spin and pray um, the, you know, technique where they'll just, you know, spin their way through a technical rock garden section or up a technical climb. And man, they're just praying that their pedals don't hit something, right? Like you see this on trails all the time. You see gouges taken out of rocks in these technical sections. And what they are is from people spinning and just praying that they don't smash their pedal into something. And so again, if you stand up, and you uh, use quarter and half pedal strokes and you have more tension at the pedals, you're able to navigate these sections in a much safer and a more efficient way, right? Like it's not safe to just pray that you're not gonna smash your pedal into something which could cause you to wreck. If you're able to navigate your way through and, and you use technical skill to get yourself through and, and, and to not smash your pedal on something, that's a much better and safer way to, uh, to do it. Right. And so um, the so like I said, you know, these the, the, the technical climbs, the technical trail sections, jumps and drops, like all of these things are best handled from the standing position with some tension at the pedal. So you have to do it. If you're going to be a mountain biker, you're going to have to do these things. This is one of the things that separates mountain biking from other cycling uh, disciplines. If you want to, you know, go ride gravel roads, go do that. If you want to ride the roads, do that. Like, But if you're going to be on trail, 
then the trail is going to demand these high tension technical things from you. And so if you are not strong with the platform that you need to execute these things from, again, I think most riders, they don't have a technical skill problem, right? They're going to these skills camps and stuff like that, and their standing pedaling just sucks. And, they, and if they would just stand up more on the trail, they'd actually figure out a lot of these things naturally rather than having to go to some camp and spend hundreds of dollars and spend a whole weekend listening to someone explain to you the 10 steps of cornering or whatever it is like that, right? I'm not saying there's no value in those things. I just, I think that most riders, their problem is not needing to take a skills camp. It's needing to learn how to move properly on their bike in the first place, which requires good movement skills off of the bike. And then the application of good movement skills to the bike, which includes the use of standing pedaling and making it a strength instead of something that you avoid at all costs, right? So, um, so like I said, that's uh, the, the idea that seated pedaling is more efficient is, you know, potentially false. And at, at, at uh, best, and, you know, it, it, it's also, or worse than, you know, the best it's got is that it's just incomplete, right? Is even if it is true, it's an incomplete look at what we do on the trail. And so even if that is true, you still, that's not an excuse to just use that for everything on the trail because that is an unsafe, less efficient way to trail ride and, and not use your skills. So lastly, I saved the last uh, myth and, and most persistent one that I get from people for last. And that is, what about seated climb? What about uh, climbing, right? Like I need weight on my rear tire to maintain traction. And the way that I maintain weight on my rear tire is to sit down. If I have my butt on the seat, then I'm putting weight on the rear tire and then that's going to put that, that weight on the retire is what I need to, um, to, to create, maintain traction for climbing, right? So one, like this is, this, this thing, this idea doesn't withstand the least bit of scrutiny, right? And so first off, we've all seen people stand up and climb super technical, super hard things, right? So it's obviously not true. It's, ob- it's not that you need your butt on the seat in order to have weight and traction. If that was true, it would be impossible for people to stand up and climb without having their butt on the seat so that they can create weight on the back seat. And then the other thing is if this was true, if weight was what you were looking for, then Clydesdale riders, right? Like the the bigger riders out there, like you guys would never break traction. You guys would be the greatest climbers of of all time because, because of your higher weight means you're able to put more weight into your rear tire, which means you're able to create more traction, which means that you're able to climb without ever breaking traction. And again, we all know that's not true, right? Like heavier riders sometimes struggle more with climbing and and just breaking traction than than, than smaller riders do. And so if, if that statement is true, that we need weight on the seat for that purpose, then neither one of these other things that I just brought up would be true as well. All right. And so therefore we know right there that like, well, that isn't true. There's more to the story. So what is the rest of the story? And the rest of the story is understanding the difference between weight and pressure. And again, this is like efficiency, right? Like people throw words around in the mountain biking world and they don't really understand what they're talking about and they don't use them properly. And so we don't want weight. We want pressure on the back tire. Now pressure is weight used actively. So to think about this, um, think about standing on the bathroom scale, right? Like you got one of those old timey, uh, you know, old fashioned bathroom scales. It's got the, the needle there and you step on it and the little thing rotates around until it gets to the, the weight that you're at. Now we've all done this, right? Where there's a kid or whatever, where you're standing on that scale and then you decide to put pressure through your feet, right? Like you, you put pressure through your feet and you see the, the scale move. It goes past where you were, right? So so say I weigh 170 pounds. And then again, I'm not jumping, right? I'm not breaking contact with the scale. I'm just simply like doing a little like just pressure down, right? We can all envision this because we've done this, right? And you can see that scale start to move. Well, how did that happen, right? I don't weigh more than 170 pounds. And yet somehow I was able to make the scale register more than 170 pounds. So according to the scale, I weighed more than what I actually weighed for a moment in time, right? And so, well, why is that? And that's pressure. I'm, I'm actively using my weight to drive down into the, the scale and that creates more weight on the scale than what it naturally would, right? You can also think about this in terms of, let's say you got a truck that's uh, stuck in the sand or something like that, right? 
So one of the things that you would do is get people to start climbing in the back of the truck, right? Let's put some weight on the rear tires and see if that does the trick. But at a certain point, just piling people in the back creates its own problem. You can put so much weight in the back that you actually start to make the problem worse and you're sinking in more. So what do you do, right? Well, that's when you get people standing in the back or standing on the bumper and you get them to start bouncing, right? If you've ever had a truck stuck or helped somebody get a truck unstuck, you've seen this where people are bouncing. And why are they bouncing, right? Well, that bouncing is, is weight used actively. They're creating pressure down into the truck. And what that does is it pushes the, the weight down uh, you know, more, which creates more traction for the tires, right? That pressure, the, you, you bouncing creates more pressure through the tires into the ground, and that extra pressure can create more traction, which gets things going. So this is what you want when you're climbing, right? Like you want pressure, not weight, and weight is used actively. In fact, what you want is a pressure to weight ratio. Right? So this is why bigger riders can sometimes have a problem because they weigh so much that even though they're able to create a lot of pressure, the pressure to weight, weight ratio is not where they need it to actually keep traction. Right? This is why smaller riders are sometimes some of the better, the best climbers. It's not just their weight and, and them weighing less. It's that they're able to create pressure and high levels of pressure with a small body weight creates a high pressure to weight ratio and that's the ultimate i gig or, or you know thing behind traction right so obviously technique and stuff like that as long as all things being equal but the more pressure to the higher the pressure to weight ratio the more traction you're going to create and so well, how do you this is what you want to bike right so how do we do this and what you want to do is you want to create that pressure right and so you're using your weight and again, if you think about this, right, like if you've been riding for any period of time, you've naturally found yourself doing this, whether you're sitting down or you're standing up, you're going up a climb, the traction's loose, and you're naturally like with each pedal stroke, there's a little bit of pressure that you're putting down through the back tire into the ground. You put the pressure down, it comes off. Put the pressure down, it comes off, right? Like it's not a steady weight and pressure on the climb. There's this bouncing, slight bouncing motion that you're creating naturally because your body instinctively recognizes what you need to do and it's this pressure that you're looking for right and so your butt is going to be somewhere in the same area as if you were sitting down this is one of the problems is it creates because your butt's in that area it looks like well the seat i should be sitting down but you can lower your seat and keep your butt in that same general area right and so now you have your butt in the position that you need to create that pressure but you can do it more efficiently and more effectively because you're able to move your center of gravity around and you're able to move the hips and, and your body more to create that pressure that you need to climb. And so again, like once you figure it out, once you understand how to use that, then standing climbing becomes easier and, and better for keeping traction than seated climbing does because you can use that pressure more effectively. So another, um, uh, or your weight more effectively, right? Like you can't use that weight. If it's sitting on the seat, then you can't use the weight as effectively. Now, another thing that this does is it gets your, uh, it's better for your body, right? Because when you're creating that pressure and you're sitting down, you're basically driving your taint, right? The area of your, your crotch, your groin into the seat, right? Now, this is one of the reasons that so many riders have problems with that area. There's special seats and all this stuff for that. And it's because you're basically using your crotch as the other end of the wedge, right? Like we are creating a wedge. A wedge is something that fills space between two things. And by increasing or decreasing that, that, that pressure, you can change that space. And so we're, we're effectively a human wedge when we get on the bike. We're creating a wedge between the pedals. And when we're sitting down the other end of the wedge, the other pressure point is our groin. And when we stand up, the other pressure point becomes our hands. Okay, and so when you stand up, you're creating that wedge between your feet and your hands. And that is how your body's designed to work. That's like doing a deadlift or something like that, right? So your, your groin is a sensitive area. It's not designed to be used as part of a high tension wedge to create pressure. And so uh, it's much better for you and your, your groin, your sensitive areas down there, if you stand up and your hands are creating that pressure and they're the other side of that wedge. So, um, so anyway, so as you can see, standing up is a better position to create movement from. It is a safer position to tackle technical trail problems from, 
and you can actually create better climbing traction once you know how and you understand that it's pressure and not weight that you're looking for and you can use your weight more effectively when you're not sitting down. So, but like anything else, right, there's a learning curve to this and you're gonna have to go through that. And, you know, I mentioned this over and over and over again, right? They call it the dip, right? Like you have a certain level of performance, you come across something that can lead you to a higher level of performance, but when you first start implementing it, you may see your current level dip down a little bit. But as you get better with this new technique, you're gonna come out the other side and your, level, your performance level is gonna be higher. And so you may find that this happens with standing pedaling, right? At first it's gonna feel hard and it's gonna feel awkward, but with practice, it's gonna get better. And it, you can turn it into a strength instead of a weakness. And man, when you can stand up and pedal at will, and it is a strength, you are gonna be a much stronger, much more dynamic, much more injury resistant rider than if you're just sitting sitting and spinning, right? And so um, something that can help with this, couple pieces of advice to help you with making the switch. So first, make sure that you are using flat pedals when you make this switch. If you wanna switch back to clipless pedals at some point, that's great, whatever, right? But flat pedals, particularly the catalyst pedals, the ones that I designed to support your entire uh, arch, um, they're gonna create a more stable platform for your feet when you stand up, right? Like this is, one of the, another problem that we have with standing pedaling is that because of the design of, of pedals and you know clipless pedals in particular, right, the, the float and the lack of actual contact between your foot and the pedal body, right, like this creates a, a lack of stability when you stand up. It's that, that is not a, as stable a position for your foot as standing on a good flat pedal. Right, you don't have a solid connection with a clipless pedal. Right, it's this weird thing. We think that like we're connected to the pedal, and so it's a more solid connection. But you're just attached to it. You're not really like have a good solid connection. Like float, right? Your foot moves side to side. Uh, clipless pedals tend to be relatively small, and so you don't have the contact space. Your foot doesn't actually contact the pedal itself a lot of times. It kind of like floats over the pedal body, and so uh, you got super stiff. Um, carbon soles that don't have good traction. So when it is contacting the pedal body, it's still creating this kind of stiff platform that doesn't feel normal for you. All of this adds up to create the sensation of being off balance and awkward. And so, you know, this also leads people to feel like I need to sit down more. I just, I feel like a baby deer taking its first few steps when I stand up because my toes tilt forward, I don't really have good contact, and my weight's being pitched forward because of that. And so if you are using pedals, your uh, flat pedals, you're using more of a midfoot position that balances out the pressure going into the pedal, you're gonna find that when you stand up, it feels much, much, much more stable. Like I said, like doing, uh, using something like the catalyst pedal, especially when you stand up, it feels like you're on, like people describe it like feeling like you're on a stair stepper, right? Like when you stand up, your foot feels fully supported like you're standing on the ground. And when you're pedaling, there's none of this weird, awkward movement that goes on with smaller uh, pedals and uh, in particular clipless pedals. So make sure you're using flats. And then finally, uh, to help you train for it, when you're doing your cardio workouts, any high intensity, high tension stuff, if you're doing intervals or you have a workout that calls for you to you know, ramp up to a higher level of intensity, right? Like what, anytime you are training that high tension zone, you need to stand up, okay? So just use your cardio training as a way to, to start training this. So stand up during your hard efforts. Don't just stay cranked down in the adult fetal position while you're trying to crank out your intervals. Stand up, take advantage of your training for what it's supposed to be for, which is to train you how to do things better rather than just you practicing your crappy breathing and position habits, right? So, you know, use good breathing, use your, uh, you know, standing pedaling position and you're going to get way more out of your cardio training than if you just ignore those things and you're just focused on trying to make that power meter or whatever it is, get to the number that you want, right? So um, the other thing that you can do is spend time on the trail uh, with your seat down. And so again, this is like an old school thing that used to happen naturally before dropper posts. Like you hit a trail section and you'd be like, man, you know, I'd rather have my seat down for this section, even though it's not all downhill, right? But there are some technical parts and some areas that I'd rather have the seat down for than up. And so I'm gonna ride this section with my seat down. And what that means is, is that it forces you to stand up, right? It's, just, it's not comfortable. 
it, uh, to, to sit down and try and grind through a high tension effort with your seat all the way down and your knees up, right? And, and so again, your knees are not gonna blow out from that position just doing light, easy spinning. So what this does is it teaches you how to use seated and standing pedaling properly. You take away the height of the seat post, you put the seat down, you'll naturally use your seat the way that you're supposed to, where you stand up when it's hard and you sit down when it's easy, right? Like watch a kid riding a BMX bike with his around the neighborhood with his seat slammed. When he's standing up to sprint and go hard, or, or sprint and go hard time, and, or hit a jump, whatever, he stands up. When he's just cruising over to his buddy's house, he, he's just sitting down, right? Like nobody's knees are getting blown out from doing that, right? This idea that your knees are gonna get blown out from having your uh, seat too low, again, comes from people over relying on seated pedaling and using it in these high tension uh, areas, right? And if you're gonna do that, then you're better off with the seat up. So again, you may, you know, again, I'm not saying to never venture into that area. There's gonna be times when fatigue or whatever it is keeps you from being able to use standing pedaling. And you may have to rely on seated pedaling in some of these high tension areas, but you wanna minimize that, right? And so uh, so standing pedaling, right? It's got a lot to offer us as a mountain biker. And, and it's a low hanging fruit that a lot of riders could use to greatly improve their performance and to decrease their overuse injuries. So again, don't be afraid of standing pedaling. Just treat it like anything else that it's gonna take some time to train it and get better at it. But once you understand why it is so valuable for you and why it's so important that you learn how to use it more and how to use it properly, hopefully that'll give you the motivation you need to, to power, you know, get through, grind through that, that potential dip that you're gonna face and come out the other side a much better rider. So, uh, so anyway, so hopefully this is giving you some fuel for thought, like I said, motivated you to start standing up more and, and get away from having your butt just shackled to the seat. That holds so many riders back. It just, it drives me nuts when I'm out on the trail and I just see people sitting and spinning through everything. And again, I come across you know, uh, technical sections, you see the rock gouges, you know, you watch people trying to, you know, navigate technical climbs and you're just like, oh my God, man, it's, you know, you just gotta like, hold your breath and hope they make it through because they're they're relying on a wing and a prayer as opposed to like, you know, skill and, and uh, technique to get through it because you can't apply that skill and technique when you're sitting down. And so again, man, you can get really good at seated pedaling, right? Like if you're sitting here watching this, like James, I'm one of the best riders in my area and I sit down all the time. It's like, great, buddy, cool. If you don't think you can get better, then fine, that's great. But you know, another thing just to leave you with before I go, I've spent a lot of time with high level riders, right? Like I have trained some of the best riders in the world and the best riders in the world stand up more than you do, okay? Like they are faster. It's not they're faster in, and they stand up more. They're faster because they stand up more, all right? So if you want to emulate and be a better rider and, and, and emulate the best riders in the world, then you need to get away from these freaking myths about clip, or about uh, you know, clipless pedals is another one, right? But these myths around seated pedaling and, and learn how to unleash standing pedaling to your advantage. So um, anyways, like I said, hopefully giving you guys some fuel for thought here. Uh, if you've got any questions, you can hit me up at james at bikejames.com. Always happy to help. Um, remember, check out the Ultimate MTB Workout Program if you're looking for a workout program to help give you the strength and mobility that you need. I've got the cardio workouts and stuff as well. We emphasize standing pedaling in those things. I've got the skills training stuff. Standing pedaling is actually one of the skills that we work on early on. So, you know, the, the Ultimate MTB Workout Program is on some level designed to help transition you into a standing pedaling rider if you're not already there uh, yourself. So, and if you're looking for something a little simpler than the Atomic Strength Training Program, my isometric training program is a great one as well to help build the, the strength and mobility that you need to stand up more and have more fun on the trail, right? Like the, the fun really starts and your bike really shines when you stand up. And, and you can unleash your skills and your fitness and stuff that way. And so uh, making sure you got a good training program can help you with that. And also Catalyst Pedals at pedalinginnovations.com. Uh, check them out because they are the world's best flat pedal. They will improve your standing pedaling guarantee, 30 day money back guarantee. If you try them and you don't like them, I'll take them back. It is the only product on the, in the entire mountain bike industry that has a money back guarantee because that's how strongly I believe in my product. You know, nobody else will give you that promise with their pedals and then it's because they don't believe in them as much as I believe in mine. So, uh, so there you go. So anyways, yeah, check me out at bikejames.com and I will talk to everybody next time.